It was a very, very quiet, very friendly uh, village. Just nice days, happy days they were, for some reason. We didn't seem to miss out on anything. I mean, you could leave your door open. And everything's changed, you know, isn't it? Everything's so much, uh, well, complicated. As I'm standing here on the on the cliff edge, and you look north, and then you see on the sides of the rocks, shale, which is partly cool seams. And if we turn around back to where the quarries were, this area was a great area of industry. Lime kilns, cool, and after that, farming. As the quarries were declining, they looked uh, towards uh, the fishing. And uh, by the middle of the century, the Helen fishing had taken a great uh, step forward. Started up the smokehouses again, uh, I think it's over 20 years ago. Uh, these original smokehouses, over 150 years old. I think they were invented in 1842, I think. Uh, and John started opening the smokehouses and splitting the heron again, back to its original, original state. Uh, me and my wife took over the business at uh, the start of this year, just before John passed away. So he's seen what making go of it. It was quite an upsurge in the coast, which coincided with uh, the great shoals of annual shoals of heron come down in the summertime. So there was any moon to walk. The smoked heron, the heron would be smoked. The kipper is split. Yeah. But we call her, have you ever seen a kipper flat out? Yeah. Which is a heron split. Yeah. And it opened up and then put onto the tenter hooks. Yeah. And um, Woodger was the man to do the first kipper in this place. But you've got to remember, well, there was smoke before that. Yeah. The lasses of employable aids who could get away, followed the fishings, they started in the north of Scotland. They were hired out by buyers that was usually fire lasses in a cove, tow to gut and want to pack. These were the doorways in, the little arches above, and you'll see the stone walk, sheds underneath, water tanks in there for the vats, for putting the heron in, above little cottages. After the, the North fishing, they used to come back to say who's is, because that would be the beginning of May was the start of the Helen fishing here, and they would walk the summer here. At the latter part of August, uh, the, the, the Helen here was spawning, and uh, the boats were laid up, getting a quick paint, and got ready for Yarmouth and Lowestoft. Well, it is called the Yarmouth of the North by the quantity of Helen that they caught. And the fleet, the size of the fleet. Birds came up, up here from as far away as St. Ives and Cornwall. In the middle of September, you'd say the fleet, right from the north of Scotland, day after day, steaming by. In my young days, steam drifters, and uh, the, mostly the sailing boats were all motorised then. He had to look for the heron, he had to sit him with the eyes, he had to sit on the Four end of the boat at the stem and see them in the water. Yeah, he had to know what you were looking for. He had to look at the water, the black water, and if there was a change in the water, there were, it was kind of a, a grey colour when you saw the heron. But sometimes, of course, if there was a lot of uh, what we called fire in the water, which was present, they the lit up, you know, if they were near the top, and they were easy to see then. Everyone would get a job with the line fishing. Shilling my children. The children, before they went to school, skinning lampets, with your teaspoon, sitting on a stool, before they went to school. And only one man's people went to the house. 
each man in the boat carried a, a line or addicts, purlins, whitens or whatever or fishing during the winter and the regular thing in sea was 1200 hooks to the line My father's family was three lads and one lass, Thomasina. And uh, he was a fisherman all his life, in the sailing days. And uh, oh man, the winter nights he used to come in and sit down in front of the fire there and he'd hear the yarns about the, the heron and well there was nothing else to talk about you see there. They talked about the daily occupations and the little times and the little setbacks and they used to talk a lot about the, the gales. I have a vivid description of me mother's second eldest brother telling me about the the, the blizzard in 1915. Well, I can remember that. My cousin Danny and little Bill Hobson, Kelpie Bill as they called him, was 15 year old laddies of the Cobal, and she was an open Cobal, got of the Selena. And they come across from the inner islands in a hole in hurricane and a blizzard of snow right into Harbour Mouth. And just no long before he died, my Uncle Dickie says to me, that I think that was the worst day an open boat ever lived on the sea. Mm -hmm. Aye. It was a great life there. That was great. It was smashing. You went away to sea in the morning. As the, the saying now, the modern saying is, you did your own thing. And that was true then. You just did your own thing. You know, there was no, there was restrictions, but nothing to what we have nowadays. You could enjoy the job and everybody, you know, uh, that was a great uh, camaraderie. and Everybody, you know, used to try and beat your pal at the, how many fish you could catch. And, you know, it used to get a bit fun, and that's all gone now. Fishing now isn't like it used to be, because anybody can go now with, it, with the, the stuff that's aboard the boats now. Well, like I say, anyone can go, anyone with a little bit headpiece. Before, you see, there were all marks with the eyes, landmarks and, and marks from the, from the rocks or anywhere. That was handed down through the generations. The tides that forge the volumes of rock, that lay down sediment like pages. The tides that crack their spines and grind and claw the rocks to sand. The tides that swell to the old moon's fullness carrying in the coin of codling, the tides that shrink from the new moon's spindle, bearing away the shoals of dreams, the tides of settlers 
the tides of visitors, the tides that bring strange tongues, religions, blood, the tides that rip through the fairway, eddy round the blue caps, the ingun tides that tug to the looming fawn, the tides that tear over the knivesten, the tides that teem through the kettle, the tides that sweep down the stream by the pinnacles, breaking in seas. The high tides of summer, the caravans, the divers, the low tides of winter, sandaling, stitching the water's hem. The tides of the lobster, the tides of the herring, the tides the men put out to sea on, never to return. The tide of secrets, the tide of memories, the tide that spreads its net and hauls, spreads and hauls, and rips and mends it, and rips and mends it. to do some experiments. This is the first time that we cross the river. Well now we're going to have another young singer, this time a boy. Scott Smith is his name. Now Scott is going to sing two songs by Schubert. Uh, and the first one is The Trout. <laughs> What we have here is an example of a, an old farmsteading, in this case, village farm. Uh, I would guess it's about 200 years old altogether, or thereabouts. The well is, the well is here, and the trough is there. Would there have been a pump there, or a bucket, or how would it have Yes, there'd be a pump there, I would guess. And it may well have been a pump. Um, with the water coming out from the top of the pump into a wooden box, I would say. And that the water would run down the wooden box into the trough. That was quite a common way of, of, uh, of actually diverting the water. In a simple wooden three-sided box. The water would go into the top, slide down, and fill the trough. That would be done twice a day, probably. We're on, we're on the line now, where I'm standing now, we're on the lines where the old railway used to be the North Sunderland Railway. Now this was done in 1896, and it lasted until 1951. The first train to be here would be the Bambra. That little train rang for good life. Now, when I was a lad, quite a long while ago, to school in the train every morning I'd go, on an old railway line that now is no more, <coughs> ran from Chat Hill down to the seashore. And when thinking of it, I still need a hanky, because I'll always have a swap for, for the old tanky. And where would you be going? Annick or Berwick. That was about the, as far as we used to get. Yes. <laughs> Edinburgh was a long way. Yes. <laughs> it, was a, it was a high day holiday to go to Newcastle. Now you can go and you've got a car, you can get there in, what, three quarters an hour, 50 minutes, and you can do half an hour shopping, you can ba be back home in, in two and a half hours. The other benefit that we had from the railway was that we um, used to send grain out from sea houses in railway sacks. That was the reason, the principal reason why the rail was first uh, constructed, to actually transport freight. And it was only in the 20s, I think, I'm told, that it was then um, beginning to develop the village in the tourist direction. And that's when the passenger aspect was encouraged. Nice, friendly people. Uh, lovely beaches, because we used to spend all our time on the beaches. It was always very quiet. There wasn't um, a lot of commercialism in the village, you know. 
and there was to be a shop on North Street we used to be able to go to. And fish and chips, that was the, the highlight of any trip. It didn't matter whether it was just a day or what, you had to come for fish and chips. And uh, one of Coxon's Knickerbocker glories the last day of the holidays. <laughs> Started here in 1945, working for E.G. Odinson. Just after the war, there was very few new cars, and there was all we did rebores to engines. We did all sorts of work, that type of work, welding, spring, everything. General country garage. I prefer to work on cars. It's nothing beyond 1958 or 59. It's the modern car. You've got to have all sorts of computerized equipment for to work on them. They're getting more difficult every day. So you've got to go back to the main dealers for most of the repairs you want doing. I prefer to be a mechanic instead of a fitter. Well, I, I, can, I can remember um, when horse and carts were, 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 were the main sort of um, mode of transport. You still had the, the cool delivered on a, on a, on a, with a horse on a cool ro a rolly. Um, the, the lead, the heron from the boots uh, by horse and cart to be cured. Uh, and then, of course, the motor industry uh, started to um, build up and, and the horses faded away and, and the motor car took over. You and I know that we're only, what, 55 or 60 or 65, depending how fast or slow we drive. Only that distance from the town and yet mentally, it seems a lot more than that. Much of the charm of sea houses in the surrounding area, the Farne Islands, the Cheviot Hills, is based upon its isolation, is based upon the fact that it's what we might call an environment that is still more or less completely unspoilt. With a brother's eye and his beak. <laughs> I would get a stone and just with a hammer, a place and hammer, and just scutched it out and built it in. There was a fish somewhere in there. The new post has been put in six weeks ago after General Broyle. It's still not working and we've asked for this to be repaired. The parents are giving me hearing about it. Am I saying stuff at the parish council? I said yes. And if we think James Street is about the third busiest road in this village, apart from King Street and the Seafield. I came up there tonight to come to this meeting. There were six cars and the Travel Shore bus came down. There's the old age pensioners bungalows yeah. and there's 15 kids live yeah. down James Street. I think it's about time Northumberland Electric was not asked, they was told that is a priority and we want it fixed. No. No, yeah. Yeah. We feel a remoteness uh, from Morpeth where the uh, county hall is situated and the feeling in this area is that people don't understand the particular problems that a rural coastal area has. And I said, I'm not the son, so perhaps you might think I am. And he said, oh, well, he said, there seems to be an opinion that you're bumptious. I said, you've hit the nail smack on the head. I am bumptious. I said, I'm bloody bumptious. It's the only way to get anything done with you characters. But we've got it, and it's passed, and that's it. We're measuring the depth of water. Oh, that's it. We're looking for animals and plants. We'll have to look for the plants and write them down. And what did you see? I saw a cow and sheep, a squirrel, flatworm. You never saw squirrels. I saw the squirrels. Yeah, I seen the king of fish, didn't I? I looked up on the bridge. And fish, yeah. When I was getting the water from the river, I've seen horses. What's he going to do now? We're going to go to the woods. I think we're going to see some... When we go in the woods, we've got to be very quiet to see some herons, maybe. One of them has obviously dropped a feather, and you can see that it's quite a big feather. 
those of you who saw the two or three herons taking off before mm -hmm. will have realized just how big they? they are oh, yeah. very big they're one of the biggest birds in the country or the biggest wingspan in the country but they feed mainly off little fish which is why they're here right from the end of the war i should say there were uh, cries from the fishermen about uh, there being too many seals. A firm from Norway, they were from Norway, and uh, they came across and they called the seals. And then people decided that that was wicked to kill the seals. So since then they've just uh, g grown there and they reckon that uh, has hurt to, to kill quite a few of the fish. 70,000 puffins will come to those islands in late April and there's other there's other different species of birds there's the guillemots, kittiwakes, shags and of course the eider duck. Both my grandfathers fished out of this harbour yes when they were young men. Fishing went back and the tourism was coming better. If you remember in those days, like I can remember, the tourist trade was much secondary to the fishing industry. We had a boat yard, we had joiners, we had fish yards, we had fish merchants, we had retailers, we had in the early days, I think there were two um, engineers based in sea houses. I've seen when the herring boats were in here, one could nearly walk across from one side of the inner harbour to the next. There were so many boats. And uh, it seemed a real live industry. It seemed to be there constantly, whereas the tourist trade, although it supports quite a lot of people, it is obviously, it doesn't give the consistency all year round of employment. I think the biggest change has been the increase, the vast increase during the past 10 years or so, kicking off in the latter part of the 1980s, the vast increase in the tourist industry and the complete demise and death of the local fishing industry. Now in 1999, what have we got in sea houses? Have we got five boats fishing? Well, uh, the boat we've got is uh, 70 feet. Yeah, there's uh, five who work on it. Yeah, and we generally we leave their home on a on a Sunday, see. Yeah, and we'll be away until like the following Wednesday, just like work maybe four days and make a landing, and then go away for another four days and make a landing, and then we'll come home for two or three days. There was a discussion basically on uh, how we could sort of uh, liven the village up a little bit in between Easter and uh, the Spring Bank holiday. So it was um, decided, um, could we have something like a carnival week then? But instead of having it when the sea houses was heaving in June or July, could we perhaps move it forward to May uh, at a quiet time? And that was really how it, uh, it came into being.
it started off um, in a very small way by trying to involve different groups within the community to uh, organize an event, uh, an entertainment event of some kind. Um, it it uh, could have been just a domino competition in the pub or uh, ladies fancy dress football was one of the early ones and that was hilarious. Because we had the harbour, that was seemed to be a natural sort of place to do something a bit daft and so the crazy boat race came about. Initially, we can gather it was a farm, farm building, uh, dating back to um, about 1745. Uh, over a number of developments over the years, until about 1812, when it was first licensed as a, as a pub. Uh, my grandparents came in here in 1910, and uh, by and large, my family have been here ever since. So that's about 90 years. They were country tailors, and came from down from Eglingham, in about 1896 and started businesses our Coxon and Sons tailors and tourism was starting in, in the area we switched over to um, catering in a small way and, uh, and then catering took over the whole of the business so really, we ha the, the family have been in business in sea houses under different sort of guises since 1896. I came here on uh, to go over March 94. I was uh, a baker of the trade. I had a baker shop up the street. You know. I was four year old when I came here. Um, and I sold the bakery in 1991. What's the difference between the bakery and the fish and chip shop? Well, <laughs> the heat's the same. <laughs> I think we've got 67 members. 67 members in uh, all different ages, <laughs> from older to older. <laughs> the Slater family has been coming to sea houses for a number of years, well, before I was born, in fact. My mum's 90, and she's been coming all her life since she got married at 16 to my dad, Billy Slater. I think we started coming to sea houses in, in numerous fields. We've ended up in this one now, on the outskirts on Beadnell Road. We're actually going around all the pubs and uh, catching anybody we can to make donations. It's the staff from the co-op at Sea Houses. They're all doing it. Basically, we're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a, a fairly varied selection uh, from Holy Island Causeway, people getting stuck, not reading the proper tide tables, to um, yachts, divers, um, unexploded ordnance. I was an auxiliary cruise guard for 25 years, along at that watch box along this side of Bamba, at Green Hill Road End. And of course, we used to get a lot of these Russian ships out there, who they, what they called the factory ships. You know, the boats used to take their heron, load them onto the factory ship, and the factory ship would uh, take them away. And out there, they didn't come into harbour. And um, when we saw them, I used to phone up uh, to um, Rosyth 
and uh, a commander Kit Kat. He used to take the message what I had uh, given. If, if he on the his secretary was there, and he used to he used to write this all down, and that was how we kept tag of the the Russian the Russian ships. One of the best laughs I had was this summer, actually, where we went, we got a call, thick folk, Huli Island, a yacht ashore on the long rig end. So we were goes and we got ourselves crept in with her, and we got in and we got a, we got a rope team and we pulled him off. So you know, we had him lying alongside and he come from Port Edgar, up at the bridge. So I says to the, I says, what do you want to go? Pardon? I says, well, where do you want to go? You know, I said, do you want to go to Holy Answer? The woman says, she says, I would like to go home. She says, ha, <laughs> That tickled me, that, and everybody else had a good laugh. But uh, one of the best laughs, I'll let her put this in for you, was me and Huggy was standing. We went out one, one, one day, sea heavy of the Oakley. And she went up onto your thing of me, onto your sea, and come over the top, and she went, do we a bang. And I, see, I was looking at her, I says, I says what, what happened there? What, what, what's the matter with you? She says, my bloody false teeth fan. <laughs> Fisherman Squire has been going for 50 years now and uh, I, was, I was working out, I've probably been involved for about 35 of those uh, w when, I w when I was a, a youngster still in, in sea houses before I went away I was in the Fisherman Squire and uh, it was, I mean the most important thing about it was it was great fun. We, we had fun giving concerts, fun travelling away and meeting people fun telling each other what was happening and the stories that people tell. And uh, people enjoyed singing as well. They, they, they enjoyed the hymns about the sea. And, and people really felt that that was part of their experience. <laughs> The M. Nelson Cup for Best Exhibit in Children's Section, four to nine years, David Gray. I spread and grip, feed and grow through invisible paths, 
round unseen obstacles. Resilient as a well-spun spider's web, tough as leather, soft as hair, I will push down through darkness, deep veins, living nerves, fine as the circuit I connect. The, the news is, if uh, you haven't already seen it, but uh, just formally to report that um, the, it appears that the representations that uh, we made, that we fired off all over the place to everybody that we could think of might have any influence in the matter, uh, has uh, been successful. And um, it's very gratifying that uh, it's possible uh, to bring about uh, a change of this kind. Sometimes I think we can despair somewhat at... Uh, the, the abilities of small places like sea houses to, to get on the map, as it were. Houses has been marvellous for the children, bringing children up here. I think it's because it's a very strong community and also it's a beautiful area as well and being so close to the beach and all the things like that. There are also lots of things going on, the scouts and cubs and uh, girls brigade and everything that children can get involved in. And also um, the schools are very good too. I have a very good first school and a middle school as well. So the children can stay here till they're um, uh, 13 before they go off to, to high school. We had chooks, we used to play chooks. What's that? With shells. Mm -hmm. You had four shells and you, and you had a ball, you know, and you used to um, <laughs> move these shells. Uh, we used to gather them at the, the beach, you know, beach. and uh, of course you had a ball and you used to, used to just meet for all. There was no, there wasn't uh, all the grand uh, made things, you know, you had to make them, you had to use, you know, what you could pick up yourself, just mm -hmm. <laughs> ordinary things, you know. Mm -hmm. I was left school at 13 to help mother. It was a big family of us. Were there? How many? Four boys and four girls. Mm -hmm. I had just fallen into district nursing work. That was long before the National Health started. <laughs> it was a strange life. If you, we, um, penicillin had just come in while I was training, and it was glass syringes, not the disposables, and you had to boil them after um, every use. And when you were on district, and I came on district, you, if you asked for a pan to boil a syringe, they just gave you the old egg pan, or the one that boiled the potato peelings for the hens. <laughs> it was it was really, you know, quite funny. Um, but the, the people were all good. Wilson Grimery, they had a family dance on the Saturday night. Bill Robson used to play the accordion for them dancing. Uh, and on the Saturday night, sometimes I'd run on the end of the new pier. Mm -hmm. And Bill Rops used to go with the melodeon and play the melodeon for them dancing. Mm -hmm.
again because it was very thirsty work. Mm. They drank quite a lot of shandy. You know, the beer was, was watered down with lemonade. Um, and of course, it was a it was a great occasion when you stopped, you see, for a refreshment because there were so many people, and they all had stories to tell. So I mean, even even I, you know, after the second war, um, can remember very clearly stopping for ten o'clock in the morning and tea time in the afternoon, and you all sat down round the stacks or round the the implements or whatever, or behind the hedge if it was um, pretty windy, and you just chatted on, and, and it was a great time. Now that is actually something now which I miss quite a bit, because obviously working on my own, uh, it's a very lonely operation, and dare one say all the company I have is the radio and the tractor cab and the mobile phone. How times have changed. The whole graveyard closed down within 50 years. But what's exciting about it is that a lot of the family names are still around. The Pattersons and the Robsons and so many others. And so it's very much a local grave. And I think the fact that children were just wiped out one after the other from a very early age. I mean, a lot of people nowadays, they can get to their early 20s, mid 20s, before they actually know what bereavement is about. But this graveyard says that families knew what bereavement was about, what pain was about from a very early age. They knew what it was to lose the two-year-old and the three-year-old the next year and the four-year-old the next year. So in that way, you know, society has changed enormously over the years. As a five-year-old, I can remember how if a funeral was going past what is now the infant school, um, we had to stop playing and, and get into line and line up and and be hands down our sides and uh, and um, wait until the cortege has gone right up past the school, nearly up to the church, up past the old police station. Remember that very very clearly. This is the this is the Pasture Hill Colliery disaster, and here you've got the cross made out of coal. And if you go to Pasture Hill Farm now, then you can still see in one area of one field where there are tiny bits of coal and nothing seems to grow there now. And that's a site of the drift mine disaster. Let us remember before God and commend to his sure keeping those who have died for the country in war. 1939 to 1945. Richard Archbold of the Royal Navy, MTB, died, English Channel. Thomas Bradford, Pioneer Corps, Normandy. William Coates, Royal Signals, Italy. David Cormack, Royal Navy, Malta. Derek Curry, RAF, Belgium. Ryan, can you go around the back, please? You're a tall person.
Facebook and um, Megan's jelly. Did you have jelly at play school? Yeah. Did you make it? No, um, Megan made it Megan. at her house. Megan made it. From the babe in arms to the home for the elderly, from the rock of faith to the quicksand of anxiety, from the open door to the closed circuit camera, from the chain and anchor to the far-flung flotsam, from the slate to the keyboard, from the eye to the echo meter, from the hobnail clatter to the swish of tires, from the salt tongue chatter to the synthesized bleep that repeats and repeats, from the sea coal fire to the humming switch, from the stitch in time to the lorry loads of styrofoam stranded on the tide line. Not what we own, but where we belong, not the mesh of the blood, but the net of our knowing. Not what we buy, but what we become. Not what is consumed, but what we keep building. Not chiseled in rock, but carved in water between the printed sand and the far horizon. The deep we trawl, the deep we cannot fathom, where we choose to sail when we put out to sea. If things change as much in the next 50 as have changed in the last 50, I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine what it will be like. If we can keep the native characteristics of this rural seaside area as they are, unspoilt, wild, rugged, windy, there is a future for tourism, but if we allow the amenities of the area to become, say, like a mini Blackpool or a mini Margate, then the unique charm that brings people to this area will be destroyed beyond repair. The only thing that I hope for the village is the fact that we've still got a very viable fishing industry and a well cared for harbour. That would be my uh, hope for the future. I don't want the, the, the charm of the fishing village to disappear and, and I think uh, I get the feeling it probably will. Because I didn't think I'll be here then, somehow. <laughs>